So uh, in my remarks earlier, I mentioned how every election is different. And 2016, of course, brought to the forefront the importance of election security. Nothing sig signifies this more than the fact that at gatherings of election officials such as this, we now regularly hear from representatives from the national security, law enforcement, and intelligence communities. Throughout today, you're hearing from representatives on the Elections Infrastructure Subsector Government Coordinating Council, which is a mouthful, but also very important. Uh, and later, you'll hear from the head of the election security team at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at DHS. But our next speaker uh, actually holds a position that did not even exist before 2016. Shelby Pearson is the Intelligence Community Election Threats Executive and Principal Advisor to the Director of National Intelligence on all election security related matters. Ms. Pearson is responsible uh, for leading and aligning all relevant ODNI election security efforts, including integrating support to election, uh, to intelligence operations, collections, analysis, and partner engagement. Ms. Pearson was the National Intelligence Crisis Manager for the 2018 midterm elections, uh, where she managed critical election security issues and increased information sharing operations across the intelligence community. Uh, we are pleased to have Shelby Pearson with us and uh, welcome her for remarks. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate the warm welcome from two very important constituencies for me in the intelligence community. One, of course, working very closely, as you heard a moment ago, with all of the myriad of organizations that help state and local election officials successfully execute one of the most core components of our democracy, and that's the act of participating in voting and the elections that are coming up. Also, the press. I'm delighted to be here among my colleagues who serve uh, in the press, which is also an equally important component of election security because our collective responsibility is not only securing the infrastructure, but also explaining to the American people how this work is done so that they understand the threats and that that transparency, and you'll hear me conclude on this comment in a few minutes, that this transparency should not deter participation in elections, but should empower the electorate to know the threats and know the resources that are available to individual voters to support an educated and effective vote uh, as we go into not only November, but uh, frankly, all elections as we go forward. So I wanted to share with you a few comments about where we're at as an intelligence community, a bit about my work and what I hope to bring in service of the intelligence community and the government, and then a bit about the threats and going forward. So as was mentioned, uh, 2016, I think, has been characterized as a watershed moment for the intelligence community. And I think that's true in terms of its recognition and a moment in time in which the intelligence community had very valuable information about the threats that we were facing and the activity that was being undertaken as we led into the 2016 elections. However, the intelligence community didn't simply begin working those threats in 2016. I always like to point out to colleagues that we have long had a commitment to the comprising disciplines of counterintelligence that which is Foreign Intelligence Services behavior here in the United States, cyber, which of course threatens our critical infrastructure, as well as bringing regional expertise and, and frankly the very elegant and important accesses. A future voter is already complaining about where, where we're going. I'll, I'll do it better, I promise. But as I was saying, cyber and counterintelligence and regional expertise did not begin in 2016. And so I do think we have very much a many decades long momentum in these disciplines that has further focused our effort in 2016 and has propelled us to dedicate additional resources 
integrate further as we go into, as we said in 2018, and further into 2020. So let me talk a bit about how we came to where we're at today, at least structurally. So for us, um, as an intelligence community, as I said, I think we had momentum across the disciplines that are so critical to this topic, and yet we recognized that having individuals like myself across the intelligence community who are held accountable for integrating those disciplines that I just mentioned would be yet another opportunity and step forward. So I'm delighted that I don't stand in the position as the ODNI's election threat executive alone. In fact, most of the relevant intelligence organizations, DHS, FBI, NSA, and CIA, as well as the ODNI, have all designated executive leads and have teams that work this topic. So what I appreciate about that is that we've had a very deliberate evolution of the resources and bureaucracy. I'm keenly cognizant of where we've come from in terms of the judiciousness we need to have as federal leaders to not simply respond by creating a new bureaucracy to address a new threat. Rather, be very scoped and very deliberate in how we do this. And I think the election threat executive position is one gesture and one uh, push in that direction, but it's probably not done. We certainly recognize that election security is but a moment in time across a pretty consistent threat of malign influence that might focus on the particular election event, but that there are many, many other activities and vectors that our adversaries use to pursue us when it's not election day. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. So former Director Coates, who I think, as everyone recognizes, had a unique vantage point as an elected official, really understood, I think, both in his experience as the ODNI, as well as his experience uh, participating in the legislature, uh, really appreciated the opportunity and intersection of not only working this as an intelligence topic, but frankly, also the commitment that I and my colleagues must have to exposing our work to the public, to exposing our work to Congress, because public confidence, as I mentioned a minute ago, is so critical to this topic. Director Coates created the election threat executive coming out of 2018 and, and uh, identifying the position in 2019, and the support for this endeavor and this position only continues and is strengthened under the leadership of acting DNI McGuire as we go into 2020. And of course, by the White House and the National Security Council as we continue to work policies to improve our support to election security. So as was said in the introductory remarks, I'm responsible for bringing the full force of the IC to this critical topic. And for me, that includes everything from developing new accesses, analysis to inform policy, as well as enabling operations to stop this activity. What's important to point out, particularly for the public, is that we don't do this independently. We recognize that, again, the rightful mission areas and authorities of the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation are critical partnerships and inroads to organizations uh, working with the states and, again, in partnership with organizations like the EAC. So, again, the intelligence community hasn't taken over this topic. Rather, we have grown in our partnership on this topic to bring and expose intelligence information to the fight and responsibilities of those that are responsible for securing our elections. My office's most recent work across the intelligence community has included improving the clearances of individuals into some of our most sensitive information so that I have a cadre of officers that have the most up-to-date, the most accurate and the most inclusive perspective on the threats going into 2020. That doesn't sound like necessarily a big deal, but it can be, I think, as some of you know um, from reflections that we've had in other um, galvanizing moments, that clearances and access to information remains an area that we have to personally shepherd through for the improvement of good government. Second, we've also enabled and enactioned, if I can make that word up, uh, the president signed notification framework. I know we did a couple of sync sessions with 
the press, as well as the states, on how we can better engage and share information with victims who are not necessarily uh, of threats that are not potentially rolled up into the very well understood uh, cyber threat architecture. So for example, this has been very important when we have information of malign influence campaigns, which I think, as you can see, are on the rise. That wouldn't necessarily be enacted or enabled under the existing cyber victim frameworks. And so now you have another policy opportunity where we can share information, and we already have done so, whether that be with a specific individual, and that could be a candidate or a civilian, a campaign, a party, a particular constituency, all the way to a state or a specific uh, county in a state where we have, again, additional information that we can add to the body of, of threat cognizance that we're already sharing in other venues. I want to move uh, and talk a bit about how we see the threats. As we have communicated already, uh, Russia, China, and Iran uh, all have capabilities and all have interests in the opportunity presented to them in 2020. We are committed to sharing that information as we can with all relevant stakeholders as we go forward into 2020. This is a balancing act, and I recognize it's one that inevitably will leave certain parties unsatisfied. And it is a persistent one that's not unique to election security, but frankly is the challenge of balancing our national security information with sharing with the public. And I certainly want to amplify and recognize that in election security, we recognize that sharing this information as broadly as possible is a unique condition of this topic that we must meet that commitment to. In addition to that, downgrading technical information, uh, particularly to those who are administering state infrastructure, is also critical. I face the criticism that sometimes that's, uh, there's some latency built into that process, that there is potentially a lack of context and specificity to that information, and those are all criticisms and challenges that I take fully on board and work with the National Security Agency and other parts of the intelligence and defense community to try to work and do that better than we have done before. We have a full suite of tools however, available to the intelligence community that doesn't solely rest on the downgrading of classified information. And so I wanted to spend just a few minutes reminding us all that it doesn't rest on just that one behavior. Even before we get to the moment of downgrading intelligence information, we have to develop the exquisite accesses that are so critical to the intelligence enterprise. I think you can all recognize that that can be a, a very long endeavor. It takes the patience of intelligence practitioners and technical collectors across the globe many, many years, in fact, to develop these inroads to provide the warning. So it's not just reacting to threats. It's developing accesses and inroads that allow us to anticipate the threats to enable our decision makers. That's a hard task. Second, I think everyone here is already familiar with the areas of expertise that we have in providing synthesized analysis and intelligence to a very broad swath of customer base. That can inform policy decisions that evolve from everything of deterrence all the way to effects of cyber operations as well as enabling sanctions. So even the analysis that we do is not just characterizing the threat, but is really here to inform policy and to inform a full suite of decision makers the highest quality information he or she needs with which to address this threat. And then we conduct operations. I think everyone is also familiar with some of the successes that we've had in this area. And again, even before you get to the moment of downgrading information, we would love to engage in operations that stops this activity before it even gets to US shores, so to speak. And so please, again, I wanted to take a moment that as much as I work with organizations like the Election Assistance Commission, it's in concert with and against a very large backdrop of other tools and capabilities that the intelligence community can bring to bear 
um, in addition to the concert of opportunities across the United States government. In addition, as I mentioned in the opening part of my statement, this is a partnership. And it's not a partnership that stops within the federal government. I am keenly aware of the pressure that my state and local colleagues face every day as those that are responsible for securing the elections. The exposure of the intelligence community to my state and local partners, again, through, and through DHS and FBI, has been remarkable to really understand, mutually understand one another, I think has been a critical step forward since 2016. But it can't stop there, because we also have constituencies among social media firms and among tech firms who also have cognizance and information and opportunity that the intelligence community or the US government doesn't have. And again, I think you've seen and have read about the opportunities um, that we are pursuing to continue to integrate that relationship with the constituencies, again, in Silicon Valley and in our private firms to make sure that even that seam and gap is stitched. But it also doesn't stop there. And it gets back to my opening comment that civil society is also a key player here. Whether you're part of the press or you're part of academia or you're part of special interest groups or you're part of NGOs, there's an entire body of expertise that also informs the voting population. So you can't simply have the feds tackling this. You can't simply have the states tackling this. You can't simply have tech firms and social media firms tackling this. We need an entire whole of society, seamless opportunity working together to understand the threats that come with election security and countering malign influence. That is a synergy that is still in work. It's still in work, not for lack of trying or for lack of effort, but it's frankly evolving. And there's also another critical balancing act that we recognize we are supporting a democratic process and that that is also equally critical to how we help our citizens both enable their decision making by sharing information, but also protecting their right to discourse and engagement. So that, I, my colleagues know that I've called that sort of the iron triangle, and I think we're gonna continue to work on how we create a really well understood engagement so that it, voters understand exactly how they receive information and who's doing what to empower them um, at the polling place. The threats as we go into 20, 2020 are frankly more sophisticated. They've learned from the volume of information that we have shared. They have learned certainly based upon uh, red teaming the results of some of our operations and they have sharpened their own capabilities. It's more diverse. I, as I remind people routinely, this is not a Russia-only problem. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, non-state hacktivists all have opportunity, means, and potentially motive to come after the United States in the 2020 election to accomplish their goals. But please know that when I talk about 2020, that we don't see this merely as a tactical problem that starts and stops within this calendar year. This is a horizon of a persistent topic, as I said a minute ago, against the backdrop of countering malign influence. And so you should understand that what we are trying to do is take the focus that was galvanized in 2016 and move it and evolve it to a posture that is more integrated, more understood, going into 2020 and beyond. In conclusion, I want to make two points. First, let me assure everyone in this room and your colleagues, your constituencies, your viewers, your readers, that this is a top national security priority. In the midst of all the other challenges that we are facing at this time, I have confidence that we are bringing all of the resources, expertise, and information to this problem as we go through this year together. Second, and I was humbled by some feedback I received from my colleagues 
in the Senate last week. We are uniquely cognizant that as we share information on election threats, that we don't want to undermine American confidence in our democratic process. And I recall one of the senators saying to me last week that we need to be even more communicative about these threats. And I really take those comments to heart because what I want for the American voting public is that they understand these threats, that they've heard about it so frequently, that they have availed themselves of the resources to them that they can know where to vote, know how to vote if they're not on the voter rolls, know where to seek authoritative information on the candidates and ballot measures. And so that it is with the confidence of knowing these threats that they are empowered to participate in the process. And so I welcome this opportunity to work with you, to share with you the challenges that we face at going to 2020, and that it's those threats and the cognizance of those threats that I think will strengthen the foundation upon which every voter will undertake when they go to the ballot box for the primaries and when they go in, in November 2020. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to my colleagues, and I really appreciate the partnership, and let's continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. I, it was really uh, a great reminder of of the work that's been done, not only at the federal level, but it also reminded me uh, one of the, the great privileges I have as a commissioner on the AC is getting to travel around the country and, and see election officials in their offices and at their conferences and really all of the work that they've been doing uh, since 2016 to really embrace this security challenge and make our elections more secure than they've ever been. I see colleagues here uh, from the Government Coordinating Council uh, and many state and local election officials who I've seen in their states and seen the real change that they've made. And so uh, I applaud them for that and thank them for that work and certainly uh, our other federal partners who have been working in this space uh, to make this election secure. Uh, we are going to transition now to our next panel. Uh, Commissioner Tom Hicks is going to lead a panel on accessibility, and so we would welcome them to the stage. Thank you all. <laughs>